This video is about Einstein's groundbreaking paper on Brownian motion titled On the movement of small particles suspended in stationary liquids required by the molecular kinetic theory of heat. In this article, Einstein shows that according to the molecular kinetic theory of heat, bodies of microscopically visible size suspended in liquids must as a result of thermal molecular motions, perform motions of such magnitude that these motions can easily be detected by a microscope. Einstein states that if n suspended bodies, which you can think of as particles, are present in the volume V star, and n over V star is defined as nu, which are particles per unit volume, and if the separation between neighboring bodies is sufficiently large, there will correspond to them an osmotic pressure P of this magnitude, RT over V star N over N, which is just simply the ideal gas law. But in this case, we are using it for the molecular kinetic theory of heat. As I said, lowercase n is the number of particles whereas uppercase n denotes the number of true molecules per mole, so it's the Avogadro number, whereas R is the universal constant, T is the temperature, and this can be also written as RT over capital N nu. And in the next part, Einstein shows that the molecular kinetic theory of heat does indeed lead this broader conception of osmotic pressure, which is not only true for ideal gases, but is also true for suspended bodies. If P1, P2, dot, 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 PL are state variables of a physical system, then the entropy of the system can be written in the following form. And we saw this in a previous article from Einstein, where he wrote the entropy like this, S is equal to E bar over T plus the Boltzmann constant, which in Einstein articles, it is written as two times a constant K. So this two K here represents the Boltzmann constant, but he calls it two K instead of K or KB, K Boltzmann, but that's just a constant. Then we have the natural log of an integral, E to the minus, energy divided by 2kt dp1 dot 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 dpl. Here t denotes the absolute temperature as we know and e bar is the energy of the physical system and e without the bar is the energy as a function of these variables p1 pl. The integral is to be extended over all combinations of the values of the p's, p1, p2, pl, consistent with the conditions of the problem. k, this k here is connected with the constant capital N that we mentioned earlier, and in particular 2k times N is equal to R. So this is basically the law k Boltzmann equal to R over N, where k Boltzmann is simply equal to 2k in Einstein's article. And then Einstein writes the expression for the free energy. The free energy F is simply equal to E bar minus Ts, so we can derive it from the expression above, and it is therefore equal to minus R over N, so we can substitute the expression for 2k, and then we have T, because we have multiplied by t, and then natural log integral e to the minus e n over r t dp1 dot 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 dpl. And we can also rewrite it formally as minus r t over n natural log of b, which is the partition function. And it is this integral here. This is how Einstein rewrites 
the free energy and b is an integral that Einstein rewrites in this form integral of j over the coordinates not these state variables but now let me specify it because these state variables contain the positions and also the momenta and the positions for example are dx1 dy1 dz1 which are the three coordinates of the first particle for example the coordinates of the center of mass of the first particle then we have dx2 dy2 dz2 and so on and so forth and then you also have momenta einstein rewrites the integral b this integral here in this fashion we integrate the function j over only the coordinates of space not momenta so let me write dx1 dy1 dz1 dot 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 and then we have dxn so you have to be careful here you have the index n because you have n particles whereas here we have l because the coordinates p are more than n because they contain all the positions and all the momenta the coordinates for positions and momenta but in this case lowercase n appears because of course these differentials are related to the number of particles so we have dx1 dx2 dxn so dy1 dy2 dyn and dz1 dz2 dzn and j will be an integral only over the momenta so it will be of this form j will be an integral of this function e to the minus en over rt over the momenta if for an ideal gas for example we found it to be of this form integral e to the minus p squared divided by 2 the mass of the particle kt dp to the power 3n and in this case k here is used as the Boltzmann constant it's what Einstein calls 2k so for example here for the energy of the single particle due to momentum we have p squared over 2m and therefore we get a factor of 4 according to Einstein's notation but so that's not really important if you use Einstein's notation you should have a factor of 4 here but if you are consistent with what is usually done in books you get a factor of 2 you just have to know what kind of constant you're using here but anyway we are not going to use this expression it is just to remind you that we have already derived something like this Einstein simply rewrites everything in a different form these are concepts that we have already used and as you can see j does not depend on the volume so the result of this integration will give us j times we have to integrate over the volume v star for the n particles so we have v star to the power n and from this we get f which is equal to minus rt over n we have natural log j plus n natural log v star like this and therefore if we want to get pressure pressure is defined as minus the derivative of the free energy with respect to v star and this will give us the ideal gas law or in this case a law that can be also used for suspended particles which is exactly the same and if you take this derivative you get rt over v star n over capital n which can also be written as rt over n nu and nu remember is lowercase n over v star so the number of particles per unit volume so this consideration demonstrates that the existence of osmotic pressure is a consequence of the molecular kinetic theory of heat and that according to this theory dissolved molecules and suspended particles and ideal gases behave completely identically with regard to osmotic pressure at this point einstein supposes that suspended particles are randomly distributed in a liquid and we wish to investigate their state of dynamic equilibrium under the assumption that the force that he calls 
capital K, which depends on the position but not on the time, acts on the individual particles. So this force is a force per particle. For the sake of simplicity, Einstein assumes that the force is everywhere in the direction of the x-axis. If the number of suspended particles per unit volume is nu, as we know, then in the case of thermodynamic equilibrium, nu is a function of x, and the variation of the free energy vanishes for an arbitrary virtual displacement delta x of the suspended substance. Therefore, what he writes is the variation of the free energy, which is equal to delta E minus T delta S, so T is, is a constant in the, the thermodynamic equilibrium, and this must be equal to zero. At this point, Einstein finds an expression for delta E and delta S. In particular, the total force, which is along X for simplicity, is equal to minus the variation of the energy with respect to the variation of the coordinate x. So minus a derivative of, of the energy with respect to the coordinate gives us a force. And this force can be obtained from uppercase k. And we have to integrate from zero. Let's assume that the motion is bounded by the coordinate x equal to zero and the coordinate x equal to l. And we also assume that the liquid as a cross-section equal to 1, perpendicular to the x-axis. And therefore, here we have to write uppercase k, the force per particle. Then we multiply by the number of particles nu per volume. And then we multiply by the infinitesimal volume, which is 1, the cross-section. This is the cross-section perpendicular to the x-axis, times dx. And therefore, this is the total force. So from here, we get variation of the energy equal to minus integral from 0 to L, capital K, nu, variation of x, dx. And similarly, we have to find the variation of the entropy. For the entropy, we saw also in the previous article by Einstein regarding the photoelectric effect, we can write entropy S as the number of particles times the Boltzmann constant Kb, or if you want 2k, if you want to use Einstein notation, times the natural log of the volume plus constant. And if you take the differential of this, ds is equal to nk Boltzmann differential of volume divided by volume. And n divided by the volume is what we called nu. So we have nu k Boltzmann differential of the volume. In this case, for the volume, we have to consider that the differential of the volume is equal to the cross section, which is equal to 1, times dx. So we only have dx there. Therefore, the entropy S is integral from 0 to L nu k Boltzmann dx, like this. And if we take the variation of the entropy, we have integral from 0 to L. Then here, in this expression, we are changing only the coordinates x. Also nu depends on the coordinates x, but we are varying explicitly this variable x. So we have to rewrite the variation of the entropy as integral from 0 to L, nu k Boltzmann, and then here we have the differential of the variation of x. Because the variation or the differential, they can be exchanged. We can exchange the order between these two operators, since this is an independent variation. And we can rewrite this differential also as the derivative of the variation of x with respect to x, dx. We can rewrite it like that. And now, if we integrate by parts, knowing that the variation is equal to zero at the boundary, we get that 
This integral can be written as minus integral from 0 to L of, we have delta x, and then we have the derivative of nu k Boltzmann, but k Boltzmann is a constant, so we have nu with respect to x, k Boltzmann, and then here we have dx, just like this. Or if you want, since k Boltzmann is equal to r over capital N, this can be written as minus integral from 0 to L, r over n, derivative of nu with respect to x, variation of x, dx. And now, by knowing that the variation of the free energy should be equal to 0 from here, and from the fact that the variation of the energy can be written like this, and the variation of the entropy can be written like this, we find the following equation, minus uppercase k times nu plus rt over n derivative of nu with respect to x equal to zero. And we also know that the pressure is equal to rt over n nu. Therefore, we can rewrite this as capital K nu minus derivative of the pressure with respect to x equal to zero. And this last equation states that the force capital K is balanced by the forces of osmotic pressure. And we will use this equation here, this one or this one, to determine the coefficient of diffusion of the suspended substance. And if the suspended particles are of spherical shape, where capital P is the radius of the sphere and the coefficient of friction of the liquid is mu, then the force capital K imparts to the individual particle the velocity capital K divided by 6 pi mu capital P. This is due to Stokes' law. And Einstein makes use of this law because this velocity here, if we multiply it by nu, the number of particles per volume, gives us a flux, a flux of particles. Because we have particles per volume times velocity, which is, of course, length over time. So what we get is simply particles per surface per time. And further, if D, capital D, denotes the coefficient of diffusion of the suspended substance, then minus capital D, derivative of nu with respect to x, particles will pass through the unit cross-section per unit time due to diffusion. So this term here represents the particles which are moving where the concentration is smaller because if this derivative is positive, meaning that the concentration will be higher, we will get a minus sign. So this means that the particles tend to move where the concentration is smaller. And therefore, if we add this term to this term here, we must get zero for equilibrium. So for dynamic equilibrium, we must get new capital K divided by 6 pi mu capital P minus d d nu dx equal to zero, which has exactly the same form as this expression here. And from the two equations, we can find an expression for the coefficient of diffusion. So we obtain d equal to rt over n times 1 over 6 pi mu times p. Einstein now turns to a closer examination of the random motions, which caused by thermal molecular motion give rise to the diffusion just investigated. We must assume that each individual particle 
performs a motion that is independent of the motions of all the other particles. Similarly, the motions of one and the same particle in different time intervals will have to be conceived as mutually independent processes as long as we think of these time intervals as chosen not to be too small. The time intervals must not be too small because otherwise particles' memory, quote-unquote memory, will not fade. So if their memory fades, we can consider them to be independent also in time. We now introduce into consideration a time interval tau, which shall be very small compared with observable time intervals, but still so large that the motions performed by a particle during two consecutive time intervals tau may be considered as mutually independent events. Now, suppose that the total of n particles is present in the liquid. In a time interval tau, the x coordinates of the individual particles will increase by an amount, and Einstein calls this amount capital delta, and delta has a different, which can be positive or negative, value for each particle. A certain probabilistic law will hold for delta. In particular, the number dn of particles experiencing a displacement lying between delta and delta plus d delta in the time interval tau will be expressed by an equation of this form, dn equal to n phi of delta d delta, where phi of delta d delta represents the probability that a particle gets displaced between delta and delta plus d delta. So phi of delta is a probabilistic law. So phi of delta d delta, if we integrate it between minus infinity and plus infinity, we must get one. So from this law, we will get the total number of particles. And phi differs from zero for very small values of delta only and satisfies the condition phi of delta equal to phi of minus delta because of symmetry. At this point, Einstein investigates how the coefficient of diffusion depends on the function phi, restricting again to the case that the number nu of particles per unit volume depends only on x and t. So we only have one spatial variable. Let nu equal to f of x t be the number of particles per unit volume. We then calculate the distribution of the particles at time t plus tau from their distribution at time t. In particular, from the definition of the function phi of delta, we can easily obtain the number of particles found at time t plus tau between two coordinates with abscisses x and x plus dx. We obtain the following equation. So the distribution f of x t plus tau dx can be written as dx integral from minus infinity to plus infinity f of x plus delta at time t phi of delta d delta like this. So the number of particles at time t plus tau in the neighborhood of the coordinate x can be obtained in this fashion. So we integrate the function f of x plus delta and this function f of x plus delta is calculated at time t. So we can also rewrite this as f of x plus delta at time t times phi of delta d delta. So we are summing all these contributions which are small because phi of delta will become smaller and smaller as we get further and further away from the point x. So the greatest contributions here come from the neighborhood of the point with coordinate x. So the average over space will give us the distribution at time t plus tau. So we get a small increment in the coordinate t, but the coordinate x remains the same. So this is the starting point for Einstein. But tau, as I said, is very small. So we can 
use an expansion, we can put f of x of t plus tau equal to f of x t plus tau derivative of f with respect to t. Further, if we expand this function here, f of x plus uh, delta t in powers of delta, we get f of x plus delta t equal to f of x t plus delta derivative of f of x t with respect to x plus delta squared over 2 factorial second derivative of f of x t with respect to x squared plus uh, other values here that uh, we don't need to write. We can perform this expansion under the integral since uh, only very small values of delta give any contribution. We obtain f plus df dt times tau equal to f times the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity pi of delta d delta plus df dx integral from minus infinity to plus infinity delta phi of delta d delta then we get plus second derivative of f with respect to x squared integral from minus infinity to plus infinity delta squared over 2 pi of delta d delta and then dot 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 on the right hand side the second term this one here and also the fourth term that I have not written which depends on delta cubed will vanish because phi of x is equal to phi of minus x so due to that symmetry these terms vanish while this term and this term and also the other terms so all the odd terms the first the third the fifth and so on do not vanish and the higher order terms will be smaller and smaller because we are increasing the power of delta and since delta only gives contributions for small values of it, we can neglect higher order terms. So we will stop here. We cannot stop here because this term here is equal to one. And therefore on the left hand side, we get F and also on the right hand side. So this term will cancel this one. So we must keep at least this one, but we will neglect higher order terms. Therefore from this, we get df dt equal to 1 over tau integral from minus infinity to plus infinity delta squared over 2 phi of delta d delta times df dx and this is what we call the diffusion coefficient d so this is the familiar differential equation for diffusion and d can be recognized as the diffusion coefficient and as you can see the units of measurement of d are length squared because we have delta squared divided by time. At this point, another important consideration can be made. So far, we assume that all the individual particles are referred to the same coordinate system. However, this is not necessary since the motions of the individual particles are mutually independent. Einstein now states that we can refer the motion of each particle to a coordinate system whose origin coincides at time t equal to zero with uh, the position of the center of gravity of the particle in question, with the only difference in the interpretation of f of x t dx, because in this case we have to interpret this function as the number of particles whose x coordinate has increased between the time t equal to zero and t equal to t by a quantity lying between x and x plus dx. So there is a slightly different interpretation if you use different coordinate systems for different particles, but the equation will remain the same. So the diffusion equation will stay the same. And 
the only simplification that this will uh, yield is the fact that now for t equal to 0 and x not equal to 0, so if x is not equal to 0 and t is equal to 0, we know that f of x t will be 0 because the number of particles whose x coordinate has increased in this case will be 0 because the time here is 0, t is 0 in this case, and if we integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity f of x t dx at time t equal to 0, so you have to imagine that we set t equal to 0, this is equal to the number of particles n. So these two conditions, f of x 0 equal to 0 and this integral equal to n, can be summarized in this fashion. So f of x 0 is equal to n times the Dirac delta of x. This problem, which coincides with the problem of diffusion, is now completely determined mathematically. And its solution can be found, and for example, I found it in a course on partial differential equations. Maybe I can do something similar also in this course, but not in this video. f of x t can be found to be equal to n divided by the square root of 4 pi d times e to the minus x squared divided by 4 dt divided by square root of t, like this. With the help of this equation, we can also calculate the displacement that Einstein calls lambda x in the direction of the x-axis that the particle experiences on the average, or to be more precise, the square root of the arithmetic mean of the squares of displacements in the direction of the x-axis. So lambda x with the formula can be written like this. It is the square root simply of the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of x squared f of x t dx, just like this. And this can be found if you do the integration to be equal to the square root of 2 dt. If we use the fact that the diffusion coefficient is equal to rt over capital N, 1 over 6 pi mu capital P, and we substitute here, we get lambda x equal to square root of t, square root of rt over capital N, 1 over 3 pi mu p, like this. This equation shows how lambda x must depend on t, mu, and p. And finally, Einstein now wishes to calculate the magnitude of lambda x for one second. So in place of t here, he considers one second. And for n, the Avogadro number, he replaces the value 6 times 10 to the 23 in accordance with the results of the kinetic theory of gases. And he considers water. So water at 17 Celsius degrees. And he considers mu equal to 1.35 times 10 to the minus 2. So water is chosen as the liquid. And at 17 degrees, he uses this coefficient mu for friction. And for the diameter of the particles p, he considers 0 0.001 millimeters. We obtain, if we do this calculation, it's a simple calculation, we obtain something like lambda x equal to 0 0.8 microns, 10 to the minus 6 millimeters. If instead of 1 second, here we replace 60 seconds for time, instead of 0 0.8, we will get approximately 6 microns in one minute. Conversely, the relation found here for the determination of lambda x can also be used for the determination of the Avogadro number, n. So we can also use n equal to t 
divided by lambda x squared rt divided by 3 pi mu times p. And this is actually very important because if we manage to measure the displacements and according to the formula above and the calculation that Einstein considered, this Displacements can also be observed experimentally because we are not talking about, yes, we are talking about small displacements, but this can be measured. And if someone succeeds in measuring these displacements, Einstein concludes by hoping that a researcher would soon succeed in solving the problem posed here in this article, which is very important for the theory of heat. And this concludes one of his first groundbreaking papers.